Thank you very much indeed. It's a great uh, pleasure, and I have to say with some trepidation that I'm giving this talk. Um, my um, qualifications are that I am the oldest serving consultant medical oncologist in the whole of the UK. Okay. <laughs> So I can talk a little bit about age and getting old and getting cancer and preventing it and all the rest of it. Just to give you an idea of what things were like when I became a consultant in the Cancer Research Campaign Unit in Glasgow. Uh, 1975 that was, December, it started in January 76. No microwaves, no Xerox copy, no faxes, no internet, no email, no, no hole in the wall to get your money when you run out on a Saturday night. Mobile phones? Nope. Northern, Northern Western blots? Well, that's a sort of, that was for Julian, because he understands these things. Tumor stress genes? No. Scotland hadn't uh, made Dolly. Scotland, as you know, are quite an inventive bunch. Uh, we didn't have MR, PET. We didn't have HIV AIDS. Well, we did have it, but we didn't know we had it. And uh, that's important because, of course, a whole host of new cancers have appeared thanks to this damn virus. The good news about HIV AIDS is, particularly in Africa, the incidence is going down and the mortality is going down. And the same can be said for malaria. So that's all good news. So that's what we've done in the last uh, 40 odd years, I suppose. So the question is, what we'll do with the next 70? Well, you know, that's quite an achievement. And what's interesting is that the graph of improvement is, is very steep. We've gotten better and better and quicker and quicker. And actually, for less money. Something which really, really bothers me in my old age is the fact that the price of technology is coming down, but the price of healthcare is going up. And we really have to sort that out. Uh, this is where I work uh, three days in the week. Um, he is not yet in jail. Uh, he's, been, uh, he's been attacked uh, in at least 15 courts in the last 20 years, and uh, they think they're going to nobble him this time, but I wouldn't count on it. Um, and, and the folk love them, especially the women about my age. No idea why. Uh, that's what the European Institute of Oncology looks like. It's very new. It's uh, younger than me. It started up uh, 20, 19 years ago. I remember Claudia and I at the opening with big Parmigiano cheeses and lovely Prosecco. and it was just, just fantastic. We now see 3,400 new breast cancer patients for operations each year. That's double the total number of breast cancer women in Wales. One hospital, 16 breast cancer surgeons. And we see another, uh, we do another 8,000 operations on patients with prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, and bowel cancer, and all the rest of it. So it's, it's a great fun place to be, and we've got science labs with four or 500 people in it. And uh, it's, it's really quite a nice place for old age pensioners to graze. And that's what I do, I graze. Uh, I dug up, sorry, a friend of mine, uh, who was born in Glasgow, one kilometer away from me, found this a uh, reference from the New England Journal of Medicine 70 years ago, 1943. Nathanson said, there is still a conviction among the laity that some medical profession that cancer cannot be cured or controlled. This specimen exists in spite of convincing data to the, okay. And would you believe he published five year survival data from 1943, so that was patients from uh, 1938, from before the war. Okay, this is the third last year of the war, remember. And look down the left-hand column, the five-year curability, he called them. That's a good term, that, actually, curability. Breast, prostate, stomach, bowel, testicles, pancreas. And look across to where we are in 2013, five-year curability figures. And we have done absolutely remarkably well in, uh, in that time. And the bulk of it has actually started uh, sort of midway through that 70 years. And I'll go through one or two of these and just give you a flavor of, of what we do now and how we're improving things and, and, and basically what I think is going to happen um, in the next 70 years. Uh, I, I couldn't resist this, I'm sorry. This is also from 1943, the same paper, and I would apply it to Wales in 2013, all right? Well accepted fact that's effective, but not late. Moreover, the prognosis is far from hopeless, even in advanced cases. Unfortunately, a large proportion of patients come with advanced disease, and that's a basic issue in Wales. I'm going to look into the future, as you'll see, just like uh, this well-known American president. If you can see where the red ring is, actually, he didn't take the caps off the goggles. And I have to say, I, I, I feel some sympathy for him because I'm actually not going to do a much better job 
uh, with the binoculars uh, because it's impossible to know exactly how things are going to go in the next five years, uh, never mind 20. But um, let's just take breast first of all. As I said, we're probably in Milan, the biggest breast cancer institute in Europe, if not bigger. So I'll show you one or two things we did. But important is the first line. Breast cancer screening was piloted here in Wales. And it has changed cancer care radically, in my view. Uh, we've discovered a new disease, and uh, that's because we have so many patients. About a third of our patients in Milan, that's over a 1,000 each year, come to us without a tumor that the, that the lady can feel. OK, so this is a, a cancer that's been picked up by, by mammography, by screening. And we've now got enough of these patients, several thousands actually, to be able to say that our 10-year survival figure for those women uh, whose uh, cancer is not palpable, very early, 99%. Uh, my best friend, who's the uh, director of the institute, he said, that's fine. Our next campaign is going to be zero mortality. In other words, 100%. And I think, you know, if 10 of us wants a, a flag to wave and to sing about, uh, that's not a bad one for the next 70 years. This is the kind of thing that, uh, that we uh, see quite often. This is a, a lady who was unfortunate enough uh, to have a mammography which was negative and unfortunate because luckily we do ma uh, magnetic resonance imaging, particularly in young women now. And there are a lot more people are coming to us uh, with uh, breast cancer younger than 50. And if you look what's happening here, the magnetic resonance image, you don't even need to have a pair of eyes for this. The machine will tell you. <coughs> Here's a sequential MRI scan. Did anybody see anything happening? Anything happening? If you look at the right hand breast. OK. So that's what the mammograms missed. This is the, uh, another step in technology. And we're using this kind of technology much, much more frequently in young women, and particularly women who've got a, a genetic uh, a problem, one of the breast cancer genetic genes uh, is, is mutated, because they happen uh, to increase radio sensitivity, and there's a danger, well, maybe not be just theoretic, that if we gave mammograms to these young women who've got a family history and the gene is mutated, that will actually cause cancer, because this, these breast cancer one and two genes job, one of the jobs is to protect you from damage to things like radiation. You can do this in Technicolor. You can look at uh, the effect of treatment before and after uh, either chemotherapy or radiotherapy or hormone therapy or immunotherapy. We developed intraoperative radiotherapy because we were scandalized by the waiting times for radiotherapy. Uh, they are in some parts of the NHS three months, which is absolutely extraordinarily unacceptable. And uh, nobody's targets, no government's targets, has actually uh, tackled this 100%. And what we've now completed is a randomized trial of, uh, of women in our institute who have got early breast cancer, and they have the lump taken out, and then they either have this, which is two minutes of radiotherapy down a tube <coughs> in the operating theater, and they go home, and they've had the radiotherapy. Uh, and the other half of the patients had the usual uh, six weeks of coming up every day to the hospital, many, many, many miles. Uh, we don't have a tennis, 10 of us uh, buses in, in Milan, unfortunately. And uh, we're finding a car, parking space, arranging uh, baby care or geriatric care, whatever we have to do, and going through it. And I have to say that six years on, uh, there's only one small difference in these two large groups of women, and that is there's about 6% of the cancers have come back in the group treated with this, and, uh, and they've all been curable with a second uh, uh, shot of radiotherapy or surgery uh, versus 1% in the uh, group who had six weeks of external radiotherapy. Uh, we can use the same machine uh, to attack uh, cancers behind the nipple. The nipple, we believe, is a very important organ uh, for women, and if the cancer is in behind the nipple, then the surgical rules are you've got to take one centimeter of normal tissue around about it. And what we've now been doing is just taking the cancer out behind the nipple and then putting this radiotherapy in the operating theater for two minutes. And uh, after, I think, three years now and something like 190 patients, we still have to find a single woman, uh, A, who's complained, uh, and B, has had a relapse. Uh, this, is, uh, this is quality of life care, in my view. Uh, we've got the first Haifu Chinese machine in, uh, in Europe. It's called High Intensity Focused Ultrasound. 
And it's just that, it's sound beams. It's like the echo scan or the ultrasound scan uh, that you get if you're gonna have a baby. It just turn up the, they turn up the, the, the gas a little bit and actually can attack um, uh, cancers. And we've got some really very interesting um, results. Uh, I could tell you that that's bigger, larger, or just the same, and you wouldn't believe it because you can't see it. A rotten slide, and I'm very sorry, but it's all I could find. But it does uh, work in this kind of situation, but also in liver metastasis uh, from, uh, from any kind of cancer where you don't want to go in with a knife and you just fire this thing on the, uh, the little notch on the CT scan and boomf, it just burns out. Really quite remarkable. Let's look at prostate. Um, slightly more interesting for me, obviously. Just about to hit the peak mortality age with prostate cancer. And um, we, we had a, an 8% to 60% a jump uh, in, in the period of the last uh, 70 years of 10 of us. And this is the kind of uh, uh, scans that we can do which don't tell you anything. This is um, uh, a pair of scans from, uh, from where uh, uh, Julian and I first met at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London. And you don't see a great deal, but uh, there has been some hormone given to this man in between times. And if you use a really fast uh, and clever bit of software designed by somebody as uh, about the age of my grandsons and granddaughters, uh, cost, I think, 11,000 in total, you go from that, which doesn't tell you a great deal, to this, which does. And the yellow bits, the blood vessels, just in case you're uh, interested in that, I know there's several... Uh, students in the, in the audience and um, what happens now because there are still some yellow things on the right hand side there is that the uh, radiation doctors uh, that's the surgeon having a go the radiation doctors then use a cyber knife which is uh, really is something that goes zap is it what's that thing that kids watch green man or, or the, 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 what? ben 10 anybody know ben 10 <laughs> no well, I promise you that this is Ben 10, <laughs> all right? And it's unbelievably, uh, unbelievably focused to less than a millimeter. And, and, and that's what we use now to clean up uh, those last remaining uh, yellow splodges. The same sort of uh, magnetic resonance imaging, which gives those lovely pictures, also gives you scans. And uh, uh, this is some really remarkable data from John Griffiths in London. And he has uh, been able to show uh, that uh, headaches can come from uh, brain tumors. And uh, he's, uh, he's got a variety of uh, different shapes and waves and has analyzed these and shown that, um, uh, that um, you can even detect a normal brain uh, from uh, uh, benign brain cancers to aggressive brain cancers. Uh, this saves you getting a Black & Decker drill and drilling a hole in the skull and then going in and getting a bit of tissue out to prove it. Then uh, testicular cancer, this was the, the, the big breakthrough that I was uh, uh, able to enjoy and enjoy for my patients in Glasgow uh, because of this. And this is a, a very expensive bit of jewelry, I'm told. And um, don't wear any of it myself, but uh, the, the stuff can be melted down and put into a test tube and sucked up into a syringe and given to a patient. Uh, again, this was, a, this was a, a US study, but developed in the UK, unlike most of uh, our uh, inventions, most of our inventions uh, made in, in Wales and, uh, and beyond uh, end up being developed in the United States. And I'm not very good at that, but this is the other way around. And this was single drug, cisplatin was the name of it, um, developed by Tom Connors, notably at the Institute of Cancer Research in London. And this did this, this is the first patient I ever treated, the first patient treated in Scotland in 1977, I think, uh, with this uh, drug, plus another couple we'd been using for years with no effect. And there are 53 uh, white uh, circles there. Those are all metastases from the testicle in this young man of 17. And after one shot, uh, most of the little ones have gone, and the big one a little bit smaller. And then after uh, three shots, it's gone all the way. And as far as I'm aware, this chap's still alive. Um, and I, I mean, 95%. That's getting, that's getting close to zero mortality for those. Who, but testicular cancer is a, a rare cancer. Um, Breast cancer is not so rare, 43,000 patients a year in the UK alone. And then lung, uh, lung has been a bit of an, a, a source of, uh, of apathy. Pancreas cancer and lung are at the bottom of this list and pancreas cancer is, is now getting better thanks to surgeons referring patients to, uh, to expert surgeons. And expert surgeons uh, achieve 
an 8%. In Australia and Sydney, the best situation in the world, uh, they get up to 15%. Inexpert surgeons uh, will have up to 15% of patients dying on the operating table. So that doesn't help the figures very much. So what we've learned in, in pancreas cancer is that uh, if you're fortunate enough to diagnose the patient with an early cancer, then you get them to the best surgeon, wherever that surgeon might be. Now let's go back to lung. Um, we have been running a spiral CT uh, early detections thing. It's been going for a long time, by the way, <laughs> the link. <laughs> I think this is Van Gogh. Um, it didn't get to the evening standard, however. 2001 tobacco giant. Uh, this inevitably was uh, British American tobacco, first class chaps. Really good at statistics and really good at helping the government with tax. Um, but, uh, but look what happened to, um, to the male uh, lung cancer uh, rates. The mortality has dropped dramatically. Uh, some women in some countries, notably Spain and Portugal, are smoking like bilio to make up for it. And hopefully the electronic cigarette will improve things even further. Julian will say what he says. He's the expert in this whole area. I'm embarrassed to be giving you these, this data. Without, uh... There you go. <laughs> okay, you're going to hear that uh, try to back is a good idea from Professor Pito in about 10 minutes. <laughs> I, I, have never, I have never had a drink with this man in a pub without coming out with a good idea. Well, there you go. That's why, uh, that's why I love him so much. But uh, medication has been notably very bad in, in lung cancer until, I think, three years ago. And, uh, and some of it has been deleterious. Uh, this is a randomized trial, a very large one, actually, of several thousand patients. And there was active treatment versus a placebo. And the active treatment was not a nasty cytotoxic drug. It was vitamin A. And some guy had found out the vitamin A levels in the blood were lower in lung cancer patients than in normal people. So we said, okay, let's give these people vitamin A. And they were all smokers. And what's happened is that there's an interaction between vitamin A and, uh, and the lung cancer cell. Nobody had actually gone to check. There are actually receptors for vitamin A on the outside of a number of lung cancer cells. And when the vitamin A comes in in overdose, it stimulates growth, like putting paraffin on a fire. <coughs> However, the good news has been that we've got some uh, good screening tools and we're getting very, very early lung cancers now by using CT scans, which is done in one breath instead of 20 minutes. And we're picking up uh, uh, very, very, very early uh, uh, lung cancers. And I think we uh, have operated on, I think we've probably cured about 50 patients out of 6,000 smokers uh, in the last six years or so. Um, and alongside that study, we found a particular protein in the blood. I'm going to come back to the proteins with my penultimate slide because I think they're really, really very exciting. And so did the two of the young investigators uh, downstairs who had their posters there. But we're now, we're now actually getting rid of cancer from em emanating from the lung with drugs. And this is thanks to a gene mutation uh, or a reorganization called ALK. It came from a lymphoma uh, study and it was applied to lung and suddenly we're looking at, instead of 10% of uh, response rates, we're looking at 90% response rates. And this is just with one gene mutation and one drug. That's just quite, uh, quite extraordinary. I was chairman of the European Lung Cancer Group for 12 years, and I don't think I ever saw a single drug out of 20 that we tested that did better than 10%. Because these were blunderbuss treatments. And this is selective, clever, what they call these days, targeted medicines or personalized medicines. And, and they really are quite remarkable and just super to see. But it's not, not all genes, and I think it's very important that we get the message that the environment is also uh, terribly important. And that's unraveling with more studies of diet, studies of diet which are also linked to molecular studies and looking at the, the, uh, the layer that coats the DNA. Here's the DNA here borrowed from Zian downstairs, and round about it, uh, you have the epigenome. And that's a series of histones, which are chemical entities which, which mask the genes. And frequently, uh, there can be normal genes functioning in there, but they are masked by uh, something which has been changed by the diet or by something else in the environment. So this is what the right-hand bit of this is, or over there. 
the environment is now being shown at a molecular level to have indeed influence on the genes that you were given by your parents. And I think that's very important. It's high time we noticed that. Because I've n never had a lung cancer clinic when some wise guy has said, but it can't really be the fags that have given me my lung cancer because my grandfather smoked from the age of 12 and he died at 96 in bed with a woman. <laughs> no, they don't all say that, but... Um, but, you, you know, you, you generally... And it, it's always been an astonishment why not everybody who smokes gets lung cancer. Well, the answer is that they've actually got some protection from their lung cancer in a variety of ways. And part of the, the bit that gets me uh, most uh, agitated, I have to say, because I'm doing a lot of educational work in the third world now with, uh, with eCancer.org, our online journal, is to look at affluent uh, uh, outcomes and deprived uh, people's outcomes. This is not Africa. It's not uh, Wales. It's worse than that. Would you believe it's Glasgow? And I came by sheer chance from uh, uh, Bristol Temple Meads to Bristol, to, to uh, Cardiff this morning, with an ex-student uh, of mine, a registrar uh, called Harry Burns. He's now Sir Harry Burns, and he's the chief medical officer of Scotland. And he said that, the, that there's a group of, uh, of, uh, of people studying young men in East Glasgow. And in the, 80s, in the 70s, they had the longest life expectancy in Europe. And now, a study finished a year ago, they have the worst. They die quicker than anybody in Uzbekistan or in uh, uh, Bosnia or, or, or whatever. And the reason is very simple, a lack of, uh, of jobs suddenly by a closing down of heavy industry and massive unemployment leading to three major causes of death which did not exist statistically uh, when I was uh, uh, starting in, in Glasgow as an oncologist. And they are drugs, alcohol and suicide. Now these are not medical problems, in my view. These are social problems. And I know that ref there are certain messages here which reflect on the on, on, on Wales and the and the devastating effect of, uh, of, of losing heavy industry in, in Wales and and this is just just awful and and these are changes in in the likelihood of being dead in one year which is associated with the environment now we've looked very hard at this due, thanks to some very good work by Una McLean who's a general practitioner in Glasgow now in Aberdeen and all she could find apart from the the postcode uh, was comorbidity, because people who live in deprived situations don't just get too much cancer, they get too much bronchitis, they get too much heart disease, they get peripheral vascular disease, they get diabetes, because of course they're fat. So that's environment. This is Ken Clark, a uh, long time ago. I don't know if you remember him. He's, hasn't, he's got his blue suede. No, he hasn't, he's got, hasn't got his blue suede shoes on. Okay, but, but he, was, he is, of course, deputy chairman of British American Tobacco. And he's also, for which, uh, last I heard, he gets 200k a year. He's also a member of parliament, it, it's rumoured. Uh, and he's also on the board of a uh, over-the-counter uh, big pharmacy chain, I think it's called Allied, and they make a huge amount of money out of uh, nicotine replacement therapy. So he gets his money both ways. Very smart chap. Um, this is a friend of mine who I see in Florence very often, and just to remind us all that we have a big uh, epidemic coming down the line, and it's called obesity. And again, this is a this is a multi. I, I, has nobody from McDonald's here? Huh? <laughs> oh, don't tell them that I'm waving the flag for them, will you? Um, so, ba basically, obesity, as you read every day in the newspapers, thankfully, uh, is a, a major uh, uh, prognostic uh, uh, sign for uh, getting diabetes, getting. Uh, Heart disease, uh, certainly bowel cancer in certain areas of the bowel, and prostate cancer, and ovarian cancer, and uh, breast cancer. However, the good news is, interestingly, uh, in the developing countries where the, just the majority of, uh, of cancers are due to infections, and uh, the big one was uh, the hepatitis virus association with uh, liver cancers, and one of the best things that the Medical Research Council in the UK did, I believe, in preventive medicine and cancer was the large trial uh, of a vaccine uh, in the Gambia, wasn't it, Julie? I think it's, And that's, come, that's now shown 25 years on that there's much less uh, protection from hepatitis, hepatitis B this is. We've now got hepatitis C to deal with. Um, and, uh, and there is now a lower instance of liver, liver cancer because liver cancer tended to follow the 
hepatitis. So this is really good news, but of course, the, the biggest uh, breaking news in the last uh, three or four years has been the vaccines against uh, human papillomavirus. There's 20, 30, 40 of them. The seminal work on epidemiology of cervical, cervical cancer was done by Julian Pito. And uh, this is now uh, a simple issue of a public health strategy. How do you get uh, the vaccines cheap enough to give to people where it matters most? And it matters most in uh, Latin America, for sure. Uh, a lot of Africa, uh, where cervix cancer is a much bigger killer than breast cancer. Uh, they, they, they don't give a damn about mammograms in uh, Venezuela. Uh, but they do worry a lot about the fact that the uptake for cervical screening is 13%. Piloted in Wales again. <sighs> Paid for by the cancer research campaign, cervical screening. And now we've got HPV as the cause, and uh, we've got vaccination, which is terrific. Uh, this is uh, one which is a spectacular failure, uh, certainly in my time in uh, what is now Cancer Research UK. We actually developed a, a vaccine against this virus. It's called Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, Tony Epstein worked in Bristol and had provided the first uh, kind of vaccine. Uh, but um, there's no pharma company is going to pay to develop a, a vaccine for some kids in Africa. Uh, come on, get a grip, be real. Shareholders would never buy it, so it's still sitting on the shelf and has not been developed. Uh, we had hopes that the, the WHO would take it on, and it may yet, I don't, I don't know. If, it, if we could make it cheaply enough, I suppose that's a possibility. But these kids uh, continue to, uh, to die. If they get a, a tablet of cyclophosphamide, and just a few tablets actually, uh, they can have uh, uh, remission rates for two or three or four years, but then they tend to uh, get out of the, they, uh, they go back to the, the villages and, uh, and they don't come back another time. So looking up 70 years down the line, um, the population time bomb is what bothers everybody. Uh, life expectancy in most European countries, including Wales, is increasing by five hours a day. So that's a big issue. <laughs> uh, the population aging is going to fundamentally change all our lives, and the scale of change will be, uh, this is Richard Sullivan's work from London, uh, equivalent to climate change or global terrorism. Uh, this is some data that he put together showing where all the, all the circles are, uh, are, little, are different countries, and these are the populations, and this is uh, in 1950, that's uh, 50 years, 60 years ago, and this is uh, uh, three years, four years ago, 2009, and you can see where uh, the shift is going, and this is a massive a number of old people. And uh, more developed countries, slightly more of a problem, but look at Latin America and Asia, they're uh, catching up. Uh, the purple bars on the right are the, um, uh, the age of 55 or over. And this is the bad one, of course, for the people who've got to pay for health care, the governments, departments of health, insurance people. The ratio of workers to pensioners uh, is the red line. That's going down. And the number of pensioners is going up. This is a forward view of Bill Clinton. I really love Peter Brook's uh, cartoons in the Times, and uh, he's looking forward uh, to, and he unquestionably did more for breast cancer than any of the politicians uh, of the last 20 years. Um, he was uh, uh, bomba bombarded by 100,000 breast cancer advocates and who demanded everything from him. I don't know what all they got. They say that she was a happy recipient. This is um, impeachment. I can't remember what that was all about. Aferis Monicus. Uh, but 100 million extra dollars came out of the defense budget for breast cancer research, thanks to that. It's really remarkable. Okay, now um, this is where the technology gets really hotter, and this is getting hotter and hotter. So I really don't know how fast it's going to be uh, in the next 10 years, even the next uh, 50 years. Um, these are Scottish chips, and you can tell they're Scottish if you're at the front row because there's lots of brown bits in amongst the fat because we recycle chips in Scotland. And several times until they're really black and heavily carcinogenic, really good stuff. I, I, it just so happens that the first uh, observation of an association with burnt chips and cat stomach was made in North Wales. And it actually got a, a grant from the Cancer Research Campaign for it. Um, it was just before 10 of us, actually. It was 90 years ago that the association was made. I don't know if they still got a lot of uh, uh, stomach cancer. In, uh, in North Wales, but uh, they still uh, serve recycled chips in Scotland. That I know for sure. This is what they really mean by chips, and this is the way that we're shrinking everything. Uh, big computers are becoming little computers. 
I've got five slides more, and I've been told I've got 15 minutes to go. Is that right? Was that, that, was that, the, was that the message, or did I get it the wrong way around? Okay. Uh, this is a pill which is the size of a paracetamol, and it gives you a three-hour film of your uh, upper gastrointestinal tract. So you don't need to have an endoscopy, you just swallow the tablet, and you can see your own movie on the left-hand side. Uh, this is the, the smallest piece of, uh, uh, of jewelry, if it's called jewelry, uh, in the world, a, a bit of a Japanese ar artistry. It's the size of a blood cell. And into uh, that sort of m machine, you can put a whole lot of detectors, which can go around the body and detect things. Um, this is a cell dividing. And if you look under the cell, you can see that we've already got the techniques uh, of finding there's just one single gene. This is the P53 gene, the blue. <coughs> And so we can actually visualize genes now. The way we usually visualize them, however, is like this. Because we've got thousands of genes. There are about 1,200 genes at the moment that interest cancer doctors. Uh, and you, 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 the, the red ones are turned off. The orange ones are, uh, uh, they don't know. And the green ones are going. And this means that we can look at cancer in a completely different way. We can look at it from the side of the genes. This is... Uh, Taupe from the Rembrandt Museum, the Rhein's Muse Reichs Museum. And you can see that even Rembrandt is now painting uh, genes in the bottom picture. And this is how we teach students now, not just around the body, but uh, what's going on at the cell level. And this is the law of genes, just like the other one. Uh, we're already using this in therapy. And if you can see uh, green dots there, uh, then you're not going to give this patient uh, Herceptin, a famous anti-cancer drug for breast cancer women. Uh, but if you see um, green and red, which you might see in the front row there, then you do. The difference between this selecting women on the basis of this test, this one test, to get Herceptin or not, is shown on the next slide. And the upper line, the yellow line, and you can't argue with that survival difference. This is serious survival difference with big data, lots of big data, and a really big impact on, uh, on women's health. And that's why Herceptin is such a big deal. But it's also in prevention that this is interesting. And I, this is new data from uh, 11 papers which were put together in one, hour, one issue, Nature Genetics, just a couple of months ago, uh, from 1,000 scientists and 130 institutions. They study the genes of 200,000 patients. This is really big data, and it's really important, because they found uh, some risk genes for breast cancer and from ovarian cancer and prostate cancer. But they also found no risk genes, and that's interesting too. Because if you've got no risk, then why should you have a mammogram? And that's essentially what comes out of this. If you population screen all the women in Wales, then uh, just by doing a smear of uh, saliva and doing the gene test, you could exclude a quarter of them from ever needing a mammogram. And for prostate, uh, there's a lower number of genes in the signature. Well, unfortunately, nothing for ovarian cancer. And that's a bitch, frankly, because um, Patients still arrive at our door with advanced disease for, for ovarian cancer. It's a real problem. Bottom line, of course, is that given all this data in the future, we're going to be able to plan individual prevention plans for people. All people should have lifestyle change, exercise, and, and diet. No question about that. But you can get more sophisticated with chemo prevention things which specifically for your uh, match. I do a lot of work with, uh, in cognitive psychology now on uh, patient empowerment. I'd just like to just show you the way that things have changed. Uh, we used to start off in the lab and then go halfway at the lab into the clinic and then do patient needs. And then there was an idea, oh, no, let's, uh, let's all uh, sit around the table, then we'll talk about the patient's uh, needs. But now uh, we've moved on, thank God, and the patient's determining uh, what the priorities are, in, certainly in 10 of us, as we heard uh, before tea. And I think that's just fantastic. Uh, with the Calcom Psychology Group, uh, we've brought up this uh, uh, 49 question questionnaire which patients uh, do on an iPad before they see the doctor. And then the results are, uh, are with the doctor within point something of a second. And the doctor sees the educational level of the patient, the degree of fear, whether they're open to discussion of new ideas, whether they're ruminative, whether they're cognitive closure, uh, as well as all the quality of life issues uh, which are normal. And this is something which I think we're going to be rolling out uh, after we've validated it. All this data, and there's masses of data now coming through. We think you've got a lot of genes. You've got half a million proteins. The genes actually do not a lot. You need a protein to carry the message. And this is, the, this is why I rated 
the second stand downstairs, so there's the genes are on there. But um, on the bottom right-hand corner here is the protein, and it's the protein that does the business. And we can measure proteins now in the blood, and we do, and uh, we can now find uh, signatures for the brain, for instance, uh, without doing a brain scan, just by taking a blood sample and looking for uh, brain proteins. So big data is where it's going. And um, uh, in this machine, uh, you can scan a body as if you were going through Heathrow and standing uh, b beside that silly machine. <laughs> your baggage is gone, being picked up by somebody else. And you're still standing there and you're being x-rayed. But actually, in the future, we're going to be able to uh, look at the level of your genes and store them uh, safely. Although I'm told fingerprinting is not the safest way to store data nowadays. Things have got to change. I, re I was at university with Gordon Brown. You believe it. Uh, because this, the, the de degree of sense of humor difference between him and me is just, <laughs> just too much. And when he was the famous man who pumped 10 billion into the NHS and didn't measure what happened except for the number of managers and the fact you couldn't get a GP at the weekend, um, uh, he really was, of course, giving you a small change. Next 70 years, exercise, diet, and smoking lifestyle things are at the top of my list and will stay there. I think screening is going to be terribly important, and these proteins are going to be important too. Uh, the video pill, the omics, the robotic surgery, which I showed you a little bit about, that's just spectacular. You heard about stem cells from Alan Clark this morning. Molecular imaging, I've shown you some of it, of the P53 rotating round. Targeted radiotherapy with Ben 10. Uh, individual care, patient empowerment, and education online. And what I do with a little bit of my time is eCancer TV, which is an open access a journal uh, uh, for uh, patients and for professionals. Um, I just wanted to say one last thing, and it's just so inspired me seeing these PhD students downstairs, that the last big experiment in trying to analyze very big data, millions of data points, billions of data points, was set up by an organization called SAGE, a pediatric oncologist originally from the UK called uh, Stephen Friend, and he uh, put a mass of data together, not in the healthcare area, and asked for the world uh, to develop an algorithm to sort it out. And this is really great technology. I, I heard about one from Harry Burns on the train that they've just found a, uh, a way of analyzing protein data to predict who's going to get chronic kidney disease five years ahead of them getting it. And it won't be long before we do that for Alzheimer's too. I suspect I don't need a protein test. I think I'm getting it already. It's which is why I've forgotten. How long did you say you could? Um, so uh, what, I, what has really amused me greatly about this whole issue of big data is that uh, all the big uh, universities uh, put their IT departments onto it uh, in the States, Oxford, Cambridge here, Stanford, Yale. Uh, six of the big pharma companies put all their IT people to try and sort out this billions parts of data. And it was, uh, and they offered $100,000 uh, for, for, the, for the prize winner. And, and it was won by a single guy, <laughs> aged 24, Chinese, living in a garret in New York. It came back to me forcefully when I borrowed this from Ms. Yen. Where is she? She's still wrapping up her PhD project downstairs, funded by 10 of us. And I found this from Mr. Chen. So. You know, 10 of us might, uh, might hit another jackpot. Keep on backing brilliant individuals. Thanks very much indeed.